well, as we know now, um, COVID-19 is killing a little bit more ma men than women. But in terms of the economic impact, uh, uh, women seem to be particularly hard hit. Now, this matters not only for the women themselves, uh, but the point here is it matters for macroeconomics. It matters for welfare, overall welfare. It matters for policy implications and, and for the macroeconomic repercussions. And that's, the, that's what I'm trying to convince you here today, that we really need to think about this in the context of policy. Uh, it's not just about, you know, rescuing Lufthansa or rescuing restaurants and so forth. Um, but these, you know, the role of women's employment is important here. Um, so as a starting point, regular recessions are men's sessions. This has been widely documented. This is from a handbook chapter we wrote a while ago. But basically over the last, you know, 70, 50, 60, 70 years, this is from the United States. Um, you know, most of the volatility in hours worked over the business cycles is due to men. Um, in the United States specifically, 76% of the volatility, the hours work volatility over the cycle is due to men, men's hours changing over the cycle. Um, the point we're trying to make here is that this time it's very, very different. And it's different for two reasons. On the one hand, very different sectors are affected. So typical recession is hitting construction very hard, uh, manufacturing very hard. Those are sectors in which many men work. Now, this time we're talking about restaurant closers. We're talking about the retail sector, tourism specifically, all the social professions, you know, with high contacts like massage and so forth. These are professions in which many women work. Um, and then secondly, and maybe even more importantly, um, the ability to work is affected by the increased childcare needs due to the closed uh, or you know, partly closed schools and daycare centers. And uh, that is affecting women a lot more than men. Now, obviously this differs by country, you know, to what extent the schools are or were closed. Uh, in many Scandinavian countries, um, they were closed a lot less than in many other countries. So there might be some interesting heterogeneity. Um, so I'm focusing here today on the United States and some of the implication might be less severe, let's say for some Scandinavian countries for precisely this reason. Uh, and that might be interesting to pursue down the road. Um, so the outline for this brief talk, uh, very briefly, I'm gonna tell you some facts from pre-crisis data, then very briefly again, the evidence on the actual impact so far. And then I wanna just sketch out a macroeconomic model, how to think this through in a model and sort of within the model, what we, can we say about the short run, medium run and long run implications? Uh, so hopefully I can get through this in 20 minutes. Um, very briefly again, the expected effects based on US pre-crisis data were as follows. So we computed that at least in the United States, women work less in critical occupations and also less in telecommutable occupation than men do. So that by itself, forgetting about the kids, that by itself would make job loss more likely for women. Second, there are many more single moms than single dads. So in the United States, again, one fifth of all children, 20%, more than 20% lives with a single mom. So again, if you think about closed schools, closed daycare centers, who's gonna watch these kids? If you're a single mom, you know, it's, it's most likely gonna be that woman. Um, third, even in couples where both work full time, which is the case of 44% of couples in the United States, mothers do about 60% of childcare. So, you know, if you think about a shock to, you know, suddenly schools are closed, who's gonna do that? You know, this unequal division is likely continuing during a crisis. So women would do more of it. Uh, fourth, we do know from other studies um, that job flexibility is important for the distribution of childcare. And then specifically we computed in uh, US data that men who can telecommute, right? So telecommutability is an important dimension of job flexibility. So men who can telecommute provide about 50% more childcare time compared to men who cannot. So that by itself would make sort of the current, you know, the crisis to the extent it's leading to more job flexibility to actually maybe down the road lead to more equal division of childcare. And then lastly, there are these couples, there are constellations where the father suddenly became a main childcare provider because the woman is working, you know, for example, you know, in the retail sector or in a hospital, she has to work on site and the father is in home office or maybe even lost the job. And so he is suddenly taking care of the kids and that 
we computed is the case of roughly 10% of all couples with kids, and that by itself could lead to changes in social norms. Um, so, okay, so this was all sort of predicting. This is what we came up with in March already, thinking what would happen. So what's been the actual impact so far? Um, this is again from the United States. There's a large gender gap in unemployment in the sense, so, okay. So basically what I'm plotting you here is the last, all the last recessions since Second World War in the United States. And then for each recession, we computed the gender gap at the peak of the recession in unemployment. And what you can see, you know, these are all pretty much large negative numbers, meaning, um, or close to zero, like here in the 50s to 70s. But, but you know, in starting from the 80s, large negative numbers, particularly the Great Recession in 2009 here, um, meaning male unemployment went up by a lot more than female unemployment. And then you see this last bar, the red one, that's the current situation. This was from May, where there was a three percentage point larger unemployment rate for women than for men. So very different again. And let me skip this, but or very briefly, we've seen actually we've been following the empirical, you know, lots of empirical researchers are collecting data on the current situation. And a um, lot of people have documented this changing division of childcare actually during the crisis. So it seems to be the case in many different countries that you know, women are bearing the brunt in the sense of doing a larger fraction of the increased childcare needs. At the same time, we also see a large increase in the men who suddenly became sole primary you know, childcare providers, but also an increase in what people collect, you know, call shared childcare. Um, okay, so with you know, these you know, evidence so far, we wanted to think this through what it means you know, down the road? And also, can we think about policy implications? So for that, we built this family macro model. Um, you know, obviously, there's some literature we're building on. So in the interest of time, let me skip that. Um, and just tell you a little bit about the model ingredients, just to give you sort of a flavor of the model. Obviously, if you're interested, there's a paper on my webpage. Um, I'm also happy to send around the slides if anyone is interested. Uh, and then after giving a sort of the, the overview of the model ingredients, I'll show you some, some kind of results uh, and then, yeah. Okay, so the ingredients will have men and women in the model, um, singles and couples and childcare needs. So a child in the model really is just sort of a time requirement. Um, labor supply, uh, we're modeling mostly on the extensive margin, but part-time work is possible. And that's important because mothers with especially small children often do work part-time. And also now during the crisis, you know, that might be a margin of adjustment um, if you suddenly have to take care of your kids yourself. Um, occupations here differ by telecommutability. And then the, the, the model itself is sort of a standard in some sense, a labor search model with job destruction shocks and unemployment. Um, when I say unemployment, really I include out of the labor force. We're not making a distinction here. Uh, what's key for predicting what would happen down the road is an endogenous accumulation of experience. So, and so with that, we can capture potential losses in this and to the extent, you know, women choose or some fathers too, choose to stay at home now to watch their own kids, they would be losing this, um, you know, for, for some time, some quarters or a year, this endogenous accumulation of experience. Um, Division of labor is partly shaped by a social norm. So in the household, so there is for some couples, we'll call them traditional couples, there will be utility penalty if the father does more childcare than the mother. Um, then beyond that, the choices to be made in the model are labor supply, the childcare, division of childcare in a couple, consumption and savings. Let me be very clear, this is not an infection model. So a pandemic recession in the model is just a shock to labor markets and a shock to childcare needs. I have an, in different work, also an infection model if anyone is interested. Um, but here we're really focusing on the economic impact of this sort of labor market and particularly school closure shocks. Um, so some more details on the setting here. We're having a, a continuum of three types of households. So the single women, single men, and couples. Uh, here's an overview of the state variables. So we're having assets, human capital, kids. Kids come in 
uh, three, well, actually two types. And that's important to make a distinction between thinking about daycare closures. So think small kids, age zero to five, and then think, you know, what we call big kids, uh, think, you know, six to 14. So these are sort of school age children. And then after, you know, 15, these kids don't count anymore. They can watch themselves. They can be alone. Um, so we don't even keep the, carry them around anymore in the model. Um, employment can be, you know, you can be employed or unemployed. The occupations, again, either you can have a telecommutable job or not. And this is important uh, because the people who can telecommute, we're assuming they can at least somewhat watch their children while they're telecommuting. Not perfectly, but they'll get some sort of extra free time. Um, and then the social norm I mentioned before. So we'll have some fraction of traditional and some fraction of modern couples. And then in terms of aggregate states, we are thinking, you know, we have the normal times, then we have recessions, we have pandemic recession, and we have what we call the new normal. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what we mean with that in a second. Um, yeah, so then the state variables evolve over time. Marital status, I should say, we just assume it's permanent, so no divorce here. The children, of course, they age at some point, a small child will, you know, be upgraded to, to a big one. It takes time, obviously. Employment shocks, um, there's nothing is pretty standard. The occupations can change, but you know, in normal times, it's pretty small probability. Similarly to the social norms, they can change, but by and large, you know, you are a type, a traditional or modern couple, and occasionally it could change. The reason we have that is because then during the pandemic, we think there is sort of a shock to these probabilities of switching, and then there will be more switches. And then the human capital, again, this is important, can accumulate and depreciate stochastically as a function of labor supply. So specifically, if you work full time, you, you can, you know, your human capital can appreciate. So think about a career opportunity. Um, and if you're not working at all, it can depreciate. Um, so there can be some losses in your, you know, your human capital. You're not working, you're kind of losing um, some skills. Okay, so this is just summarizing all of that in, in um, equations. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on that other than to say the child care needs really depend on the age of a child and on the state of the world. So a small child needs more time than a big child. And you know, obviously, if you have no child, it takes no time. And then the state of the world is the X. And that in specifically in normal times, schools are open. So you know, the child care need is smaller than during a pandemic recession when the schools are closed. Um, more interesting here is the problem of, oh, so this was a problem of an unemployed signal. Let me show you an employed person. We just want you to focus on this red um, line in the time constraint. Um, so this is the extra time, childcare time, free time sort of telecommuting people get. But they just have a little bit more time to watch the child, children. Um, and then for couples, it gets more interesting um, because now they have many more possibilities. So let's look at that same childcare time constraint again. Now it could be that he can telecommute or she can, and there's all sorts of possibilities, obviously. And here in red on the top is this utility penalty again. Beyond that is a pretty standard um, decision problem. So in the interest of time, let me right away, well, very briefly talk about the calibration and then show you some results from the model. So basically, we're choosing initial uh, parameters to match the United States in normal times. And we're matching things that are relevant to the issue, like the gender wage gap, the division of childcare among dual earner couples, labor supply of married women, labor market flows in normal times, and also estimates of the returns to skill and job you know, experience loss in unemployment. Uh, and then I should be very clear what I mean with the recession in the model and the pandemic recession in the model. So I'll be showing you a bunch of pictures. Each picture, we have the following color coding. So in blue, we have the regular recession. And by assumption, it always lasts uh, six quarters. <clears throat> and then in red, we'll have the pandemic recession, which also lasts six quarters. <clears throat> Excuse me. You have uh, about five minutes, uh, Michelle. Got it. Thank you. Yes. So regular recession, we just assume it's a large change in men's job destruction and finding rates and half as large for women, um, motivated by this evidence that regular recessions are men's sessions. Pandemic recession, we assume these shocks for men are identical for, to the regular recession, but for women are now also equally large. Uh, and then on top of that, we have the shock to childcare needs going up a sizable amount, both for the small kids and the large kids. 
And then number three and four, this is more about the, what we call the new normal. This is what would happen down the road. And here we're assuming on top of it, a permanent shift in telecommutable occupations. So some of this home office is here to stay. A lot of people, Nick Bloom, for example, from Stanford has worked on this extensively. And number four, a permanent shift in the fraction of modern couples and that we're kind of motivating by this evidence from the so-called daddy month. In particular, there's a lot of evidence from Norway from a, a reform in 93 that uh, fathers spend more time with kids due to the reform. And then that state, you know, down the road, they were more involved. And so because of that, we think that, you know, the shock, the fathers who are suddenly doing more than ever before, that, that some of that will, will stay. Um, okay. So short run effects, um, this is sort of GDP in the model. And so what you can see is the pandemic recession has a much larger impact in the regular recession. And even though we're assuming the men is identical by assumption, by construction, right? So it's the childcare needs and the, the fact that the women are also affected just in terms of their job destruction rates at the same rate as the men, that makes the recession much larger. Um, now, interestingly here is the relative labor supply of men and women. So this is women's labor supply over men's. In a regular recession actually goes up. In a pandemic recession goes down. So relatively, you know, here, this is the so-called uh, family insurance and in regular recessions. And this is true in the data. Uh, women are, you know, increasing their job search or increasing their hours to make up for job loss of husbands. There's no room of, for this insurance in the pandemic recession. Um, let me skip this and yeah, maybe let me skip this too. So the reason we think this matters or we want to argue this really matters for macroeconomics and matters for policy is one reason is let's compute the marginal propensities to consume, right? That's important for fiscal policy. So these are the MPCs here for couples. Again, for the pandemic recession, you see it's much is higher, but also more persistent than a regular recession. So in that sense, at least for these couples with kids, um, you know, the MPCs are higher and hence you'd think fiscal stimulus should be more effective here. Um, the other thing I want to briefly touch upon is sort of gender equality and sort of more long run effects. Um, so this is the gender wage gap and that in regular recessions actually narrows, right? This is the ratio is what I'm plotting here. So it, it, it narrows. And again, there is data showing that is typically the case. In the pandemic recession, we see the opposite. We see a huge widening of the gender wage gaps. So uh, this can have really uh, repercussions for gender equality down the road, and this could last for a long time. Um, so here now I'm plotting, wait a second. Yeah, sorry, I'm skipping ahead, um, but I don't have much time. So I wanted to now show you briefly what could happen in down the road in the very long run. We think there is this uh, potential for changes in social norms. Uh, I was appealing to the so-called daddy months before. So let's now feed that into the model and look at even more longer time horizon. Uh, so what, we, what I'm plotting you here is the rise in the share of couples where the husband does more childcare than the female. Normal times, we're starting here roughly at 24%. There, upon impact, as the pandemic recession starts, it goes up by two percentage points. And that's just because of this increase in telecommutable jobs. Uh, and so then fathers are doing more because of that. And that keeps rising here. Um, so that has some hope for gender equality. And that's what I'm plotting you here is the relative labor supply of men and women. I showed you that before, but I'm now I'm plotting for much longer time horizon, right? The axis now is... 50 years instead of, I think, before I had 20 quarters. And so you see, we have this huge, it tanks initially, but then it really rises and overshoots. So, you know, in 50 years, we might have a lot more female, relatively speaking, more female labor supply. And that's driven in the, oh, and then that has implications for the gender wage gap. So the gender wage gap, you know, initially we have this huge, you know, decline uh, or, you know, widening of the gender wage gap. And then, well, in our simulation here, it takes 20 years to recover. So it's a long time. But then there could be some hope down the road it overshoots big time. And the reason for that is three, you know, twofold. So here's a very briefly decomposition. It's both the assumption on the telecommutability, but also the assumption on the, the social norms changing. But each one of them, Individually, so if you only buy one and not the other, if you think is a kind of a strange or a crazy assumption, one of them itself would be enough for this overshooting down the road. Um, 
And then this, this is just to argue the schools are really key. So if we can reopen schools safely, quickly, then we do, you know, that really speeds up the recovery. So that's the yellow line here. If, you know, if the schools are closed only for two quarters, which I guess a lot of European countries are aiming to do right now, keeping them open, then we have a much faster recovery. Um, and in fact, the schools are more important for that than the daycare centers in, in our simulations here. Um, and that will then also have huge impact on the gender wage gap um, and a positive effect in the sense it doesn't make it as, as severe. Um, so I know I'm out of time. Let me very briefly summarize. Economically speaking, the impact on women and childcare needs to us seems to be the biggest distinction between this current recession and the regular recession. And that I think needs a lot of uh, attention. And it's important, for example, for fiscal policy because it leads to elevated MPCs. But it's also important if you think about the gender wage gap and the possible repercussions really down the road. Uh, and then last, in terms of you know, schools and reopening schools or keeping them open is really important for macroeconomic effects. Um, yeah, so then I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for a very, very, very interesting uh, talk. And uh, you have a rich uh, set of results uh, there. And of course, now the floor is open for uh, for questions, so uh, participants need to raise their hands, and I'll uh, I'll give them uh, the microphone in turns. Um, so, uh, who will be the first one? I can't uh, see any hands yet, but uh, apart from uh, I, I, I have a question. Can you start? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, so thanks for a very very. Um, uh, Interesting, uh, interesting talk, Michelle. Um, so the, the message here is it's very important to um, very important to keep the schools open. That has a large uh, gain. So all the, keeping them closed has a very high cost. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is a silver lining to the recession, namely that you you can change uh, um, improve on gender equality in the long run through. Um, better norms and through the telecommunication, more telecommunication uh, uh, jobs. Now, if you think of policy, it, that it, I, I understand that it's very useful for policymakers to, 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 to learn that keeping schools closed is, is expensive, but at some point, I mean, ultimately, it depends on the, on, on the, uh, on the pandemic if it, if it's deemed that the, the pandemic spreads through schools, schools will be closed, as simple as that. And it would be nice to be able to, uh, to decide on changing norms, but we know that that's not easy. But perhaps it's possible to do something on the, on, to, to alleviate uh, uh, for telecommunication jobs. Perhaps you can say something about that. Is what yeah. the government do to, to make sure that this 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 process of making um, jobs more telecommunicatable goes fast, because that seems to be very important in your model. To make jobs, yeah, but uh, I don't know how much government can do on that. Um, but I, on your earlier point, you're saying, you know, I do want to um, kind of. I think it's a little bit nu more nuanced. So you're saying, yeah, if the pandemic spreads, obviously close, or if it's not safe enough, schools will be closed again, obviously. Yes, but and to some extent it's endogenous or there's some control. So we can have more teachers, we can have more rooms, we can, I mean, there's a lot of things we can do to keep the schools, try to keep them as safe as possible, as long open as possible. Germany, for example, I did not see any of the rescue money be aimed at schools. Uh, it seemed to me, and I think policymakers have forgotten about that. Maybe we can test teachers more often. We can, you know, hire more extra teachers to have smaller rooms. And these things are costly. And now we need to know what's the benefit of that, right? So um, I think yeah, that's one of the point. points we're trying to make here. And then also we, we can think through, suppose we can only keep daycare open or only schools. Maybe both is just too much. Um, you know, which one is sort of more important for the economy. Um, that's another thing you can do with our framework. Um, in terms of the telecommutability, that's a little bit 
orthogonal in the sense, I mean, whether the schools are open or closed, that's not gonna change, I think, anymore, the telecommutability. I think that's already sort of happened, that change. I don't know how much policymakers can do to, maybe they can change the legal framework. Maybe there are some things they can do to kind of have more of that stay in the long run, um, but maybe that's more an issue for a personnel economist, um, yeah. Thank you, Gisle, and then uh, Birte after that. Oh, let Birte go first, uh, Berik. Okay, Birte, uh, do you yeah. want that first? Yeah. I, ju I just had a comment on uh, on the schools. So actually in Denmark, you did uh, provide more resources to the schools in terms of that you actually did split the classes into two. So you had two teachers to to teach some of the pupils. So, so I, I guess that is... Uh, Something you exactly. Do. So I think a lot of the Scandinavian countries actually realized this even before our model. They understood we need to keep the schools open, A, for the kids and for the working parents, and did a lot of A, resources and, and a lot of stuff to keep them open and reopen them early. That was not the case at least not to the same extent in the United States. I mean, California, all schools are still closed is my understanding, or by and large. I mean, there's some difference across school districts uh, and then also it keeps changing every you know, week or month. Um, so it's hard to get the full picture, but there's clearly huge cross country heterogeneity also in the priorities. So in, in Germany right now in Scandinavian countries, I think we all agree the school should be closed last. In a lot of US counties, they close the schools but keep the restaurant and fitness centers open. That kind of seems the wrong order to me. And I think, um, yeah. So I think a model like this can help us think that through because maybe, you know, people think the fitness centers closed, that's a huge cost to the economy, but the schools closed is not a huge cost. Uh, yeah. That uh, I should also say that uh, you're welcome to use the chat or the Q&A function as well if you want to ask questions, but uh, then uh, Gisle... Uh... Yeah, I'll be very short on the to move on, but uh, there, is this, uh, there is a constraint on how much you can do, first of all, uh, due, due to, I think the main constraint in schools, like in hospitals, is human, is, is people, and it takes some time to educate a teacher or a nurse or whatever, so I think that's, in Norway, I think that's been the main constraint to doing all these creative solutions. Um, I, uh, I just had a question on, could you explain sort of more, I didn't quite get, why telecommunication is, you think that's going to be so important for gender uh, issue or gender inequality in the long run? Uh, maybe that's a really stupid question, but I just didn't get it. Why does it matter so much? Ah, why is okay. it so beneficial for women? Yes, no, that's a great question. And I went over it pretty quickly. So telecommutability, so Claudia, uh, and job flexibility more generally, usually it comes hand in hand. A lot of people can telecommute, can also work at night, for example, like many of us do, you know, once the kids are asleep and so forth. Um, and so Claudia Goldin, for example, has been arguing this for a long time. And there's lots of evidence sort of having a more flexible job makes it easier on the margin, you know, especially high career type jobs to combine them with kids and sort of the, or the lack of flexibility and the lack of ability to work from home seems to be an obstacle to women's careers. And the reason I think is twofold. Uh, it's the, the men, how much husbands or fathers sort of help or do in terms of childcare. And we showed that in the data. So fathers who can telecommute, it's just a fact and just an empirical number. Those fathers who can telecommute spend 50% more childcare time than the fathers who cannot. And then that obviously frees up, you know, more time to work for the, the wives of these, or, you know, partners of these men. But then also the women themselves, if they can telecommute more, I mean, A, you're saving just time. The commuting cost is of course also a time, you know, you saved, you can spend on other stuff. Um, but then also just being able to shift more around, you know, like I took the afternoon off yesterday with my daughter, spent, you know, because of her childcare was closed. And then, but then, you know, I could make up for it by working at night. Uh, and I think that's typically only possible in sort of telecommutable jobs where you can work a little bit independently. So that's, that's the argument here. Thank you. A last question from uh, Tore Barsvensen, who has uh, asked in the chat. I'll, uh, I'll read his uh, question, I think. Uh, <clears throat> your assumption one, where men drops like in all recessions and females also drop, does this hold in time, this time is different? 
And have you tested the model where men do not drop or increase even and only female drop? Yeah, so um, our assumption right now is that the job destruction shops that are hitting men and women equally. And so obviously it's a right, good question to what extent is that true in the data right now. Um, now that depends of course a little bit on the country and then it keeps changing month to month. Um, so it's hard to have full, you know, get at all of that. But in the United States, which is the country we are focusing on, um, it seems um, yeah, both men and women are losing or have lost a lot of jobs. Um, and um, so I don't see anywhere that, you know, the men are not losing their jobs. Um, is it exactly equal? You know, who knows? We're saying some of it is endogenous because of the kids. So then in the data is a little bit also uh, hard to disentangle exactly. But it seems the initial the occupation that was initially hardest hit were really very female doc, uh, dominated occupations, like um, again, um, restaurants, tourism and so forth. But then, you know, the recession is going on and continuing. And then a lot of other jobs are also affected. And those are then again, more the male jobs. So I think it's not a, I think it's a pretty reasonable assumption. Thank you. Then uh, time is up. Uh, thank you, Michelle, for uh, for a very interesting uh, presentation. We were happy to share your slides on our webpage. Uh, so uh, after the seminar webinar. Uh, so with uh, that, I give the screen to uh, Birte Larsen at uh, CBS Copenhagen, uh, who has done some uh, nice empirics on on the effects of. Uh, economic policies in, in Denmark. Really looking forward to hear your, uh, your presentation, Birte, and uh, we see your slides uh, fine. And if you just unmute, uh, yep, there we go. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's easy to travel in these times, at least. Uh, so virtual, at least. So uh, this uh, paper is joint work with uh, Morten Bennetson from, K, uh, from University of Copenhagen, Jan Schmutte from University of uh, Georgia, and Daniel Skur from Cornell University. And it's about preserving job matching during the COVID-19 pandemic. We have firm um, level evidence on the role of government aid. So. Oops, just. Okay, so here first, um, this is a, a slide from at the beginning of the first wave, where there are a lot of discussions about how will we ever get out of this pandemic, um, because there's like this dual challenge in terms of we both have the virus and we also have the, uh, the lockdown due to that, which have some economic consequences, and then we need to conduct some kind of policy. And of course, we just discussed now with Michelle's talk, what kind of policy we should uh, implement and, uh, and the different challenges we might have due to those different kinds of policy. So um, there's been a lot of discussion about whether we will have this U-shape um, involvement of the crisis or it would be a V and, and so forth. And up to now, we don't really know yet. We are still hoping. So one positive thing about the recent numbers for Denmark for the third quarter is that it looks relative positive. So what you can argue at the moment is that if we could get as fast out or tend to get out of the first wave, then hopefully it will also be relative fast after the second wave. So here, what we did in Denmark was that we implemented some government aid as they also did in other countries. So it's not for you to go into details and we're not going to into details with this slide about what kind of government aid we implemented in different countries, but just to show you that it's so many different details for different countries. Here I just have three countries. I have Denmark, Germany and Sweden. And, uh, and we can divide these different kind of government aid if, into three kinds, and these are the ones we're going to talk about in this paper. It's about furloughed, we call this a labor aid, and then we have some loaner grants. It's like a, a different group. I'm not going to talk so much about that. And the cost subsidy to the firms for the fixed cost, 
and then some fiscal aid. So that is, for example, for Denmark, postponement of VAT payments by 30 days for larger firms. And a lot of details here. The main thing we are going to be interested in here is the furloughs model for, for Denmark, where governments, they paid 75% of um, of the worker's salary if, uh, if the firm could uh, argue that they would otherwise have to, to um, fire 30% of the employees. And of course, for those firms where there was a strict lockdown from, uh, from the government's point of view, then, um, then they actually would pay 100% of the worker's salaries. But they had to send them home on, on full salaries. So they couldn't like in other countries, like for example in Sweden, they could cut um, the salaries, the firms could cut the, the, um, the worker salaries to 80%. So this was not possible in Denmark. So they had to send them home with full salaries. Okay, so what we're doing in this paper is that we are interested in understanding the impact of policy on the expected on, uh, on, on workers and on firms. And we built a new data set where we um, have a survey set up to, um, to some firms, and I'll get to back to how many. And then we also use the register data. Until now we're using it, we haven't matched yet, but we're using it, I'll get back to how we're using it in this paper. We want to compare the answers from the firms to what we actually know from register data. And then we can kind of uh, elicit the counterfactuals in the absence of government aid. So what we did was that we asked firms about what, uh, what happens now due to the pandemic. And then explicitly we asked the firms, what would, how many workers are you going to fire now? And how many workers would you have fired if um, you had not received any government aid? And then we also asked them, how many workers did you file out? And again, we can relate that to then how many they fired. So we're interested in the take up of labor arrangements such as the number of furloughs and laid off employees. And, um, and we um, survey um, in, in spring of, um, so in the beginning of the pandemic, we were lucky that we actually already had a survey which was about to, to be sent out to firms. And then we could add these questions about how the firms would cope with the pandemic. So we have 44,000 firms in Denmark, a little bit more than that. And that is uh, active incorporated firms in Denmark with three to 20,000 employees. And out of that, we had a little bit more uh, than 10,000 respondents. So that would be 24%. So that is actually, and we will see in a second, that's very representative. So again, we asked the firms about employment consequences in particular, and uh, we also asked them about the expected survival of the firm. And then we, um, and then I should say already now that many firms use much more than one, just one program. And then we have, we use this survey data to compare expected changes with and without policy. And then we use register data to estimate the distribution of revenue changes in normal year, because we, of course, also in a normal year, will have some firms being in distress. And then finally, we match to register data so that we can see that what the firms are actually arguing is true. So here we have, I will show you a couple of slides about uh, that this sample is representative. It's also quite large, but it could be the case that it would only be some kind of firms who would answer. And what we can see here in the last two columns on the slide is that if, uh, we look at the share in the sample and share in population. And we look, we compare these numbers in the last two columns. We can see that in terms of firm size, in terms of how many employees they have, and in terms of different kinds of industries, we can see that's a very, very good match. These column numbers look very, very similar. That is confirmed in the figures here as well. So in the figure to the left, we can see that when we have the number of employees on the first axis, and then we have the cumulative probability on the second axis, we can see the curve for the population, the curve for the sample, they're almost on top of each other. This figure to the right 
we have on the first axis the share of firms in industry and the population, and on the second axis we have sh uh, share of firms in industry in the sample, and we can see that all these firms, they tend to be on the 45 degree lines. Furthermore, here is perhaps a little bit more of a difference, but here also again, we're interested in looking into how representative of a survey is. And we ha here have in figure three, firm size distribution in population. And then we look in the different industries. And of course we can see there are some differences between three and four, but, uh, but it's not that far off. Again, in figure four, we have it in the survey. Finally, here we have a figure which is uh, showing us how much of a distress these firms are in. So the yellow curve or the yellow showing the, the hysterogram for, um, for the expected change in revenue, um, which we get from the survey answers, we can see that of course a lot of firms during the pandemic, so during the spring, which uh, expected to experience a decrease in revenue. The white curve, on the other hand, is showing the actual change in revenue from 2015 to 2016. And the actual change from uh, 2015 to 16 shows us that in a normal, even in normal year, we have firms experiencing a decrease in revenue. But of course, it's much more centered around zero than it is in the pandemic year. So the red curve is much more to the left, a large part of it is actually below zero. Here we are showing that if we look at revenue changes, depending on how many employees they have in the firm, then there are no, not so big differences between these different curves here we have in, um, in figure six. But of course, if we look at figure seven, we see a difference between the different um, columns we have here, or whatever you call them, because we have that in these firms where there was a strict lockdown. So these will be the industries most to the left in figure seven. We see that we have, for example, arts and entertainment. We have accommodation, so that is hotels and food services. Here we had a very strict lockdown in March and April in Denmark. And therefore, of course, we see a very sharp decrease in revenue in these um, in these industries. And then the further we go towards the right, then we have the industries, which as Michelle also talked about, we have that compared to other recessions, this huge difference because construction is actually doing relatively well, as well as electricity. So to sum up, firms in Denmark were hard hit by the pandemic. 7% more firms face revenue declines of more than 90% compared to in 2016. We have that 32% of firms in early 2020 are experiencing revenue declines larger than 35%. In a normal year, it would be six to 7%. One thing to notice here is of course that it's much more than in a normal year, but also to notice that even in a normal year, there will be six to 7% of the firms experiencing a revenue decline of 35%. And this is something which is important to keep in mind when we give out these um, eight, uh, give out the eight to, um, to the firms in, in Denmark. What we also can notice is that firms that have taken up government support tend to be those firms which report being in the highest level of distress and that is very nice to know because, for example, in, in the US, it tends not always to be the case. It's very nice that you actually give the uh, money to those who need it. And finally, this graph is also confirming that is the firm which are experiencing a very strict lockdown. These are the firms who also um, take up the eight packages. Okay, I'm going to skip this slide. So um, what we have here is that 56% of firms took on eight and less likely to do so if no change or an increase in revenue, 11% of firms took all eight types. So it's actually a lot of firms took in, taking up some kind of eight and also a lot of firms, so a little bit more than 10% who took all eight types in which it was possible to take. So it shows something about how much of a stress they were in. So what we're interested in is to look at 
Did D8 help? Was it so that firms taking D8, in particular in the furloughed money, would they be better off in terms of not laying up so many workers so that that could help reducing the number of unemployed workers in the economy? And if we look at these figures, it looks like definitely is the case. On the first axis, you have the decline in revenue. On the second axis, you have the share of actual furloughed or layoff. And if you compare the top curve, so that is the one with the uh, greenish um, dots to the bottom one, which is the one with the orange squares, then we see they're very far away from each other. So it looks like if you took eight, then you fell out a lot of, of uh, workers and you also lay up very few. Whereas if you compare those firms who didn't, um, then these two curves for layoff and furlough are very close to one another. So that's the two remaining curves. Now, this is then the results. So here we have that we look at what happened, what is, well, did it bring, was it a benefit? And if we compare the only eight takers um, and look at did they furloughed workers or did the layoff workers, we can actually see that it helps. So the labor aid really did make firms uh, furlough more workers and it did reduce the layoffs. We can see that's the minus 0 0.06. And uh, the cost aid looks like it also implied that firms would furlough workers and lay off fewer workers. So here we have a decrease in uh, of 0 0.068. Whereas the fiscal aid did not have an impact on furloughs and it actually looks like it intended to increase the um, workers which were furloughed. So that is the 0 0.011. Now, the problem is of course that uh, it could be the case that you have that these firms who took aid were also the ones which were in most distress, which is probably true, but they were much, much more distressed than the other firms. And therefore uh, we, what we see is actually selection. So therefore we also run a regression for all firms and, uh, and to look to check whether we still get the same results. And if we look at labor aid, we get 10, it, the numbers are a little bit different. So it's the second um, row, uh, in column three and four, we can see here that labor aid also increase, still increases the number of uh, employees which they furloughed in, um, in these uh, firms uh, receiving the aid, and they also still lay off fewer workers. There's not a significant impact no longer on cost aid, so it looks like it's not so significant in terms of reducing the number of workers being laid off. And if, again, we look at the fiscal aid, it actually looks like it's the other way around, that fiscal aid tend to increase the, um, the number of workers being laid off. So if you want to reduce the number of workers being laid off, then this is not the, the kind of aid which is the most beneficial ones. And then let me just skip the, the lowest part here with the reported counterfactuals, but uh, because I'm almost out of time, but um, this was um, this is the model which we actually estimate here, and uh, what we actually let me just briefly explain to you what this is doing these equations, which is what I just showed you in the previous table. So what we do is that we look at the impact of the different eight types, and we look then at um, where we have remember again we have asked the firms whether they. Um, how many workers they would have laid off if they had not, it had not been possible for them to receive the government aid and how many now with the government aid they're going to lay off. So uh, Peter, you got yeah. four minutes. Yeah, thank you. So uh, what we have here on, uh, on the top of the slide is, uh, is the equation we're estimating for the first and the one we're using for the, we get the numbers fr from this equation in column one and two, which I showed you in the previous table. So this is the column one and two here, furloughed and layoff for the only eight takers. And um, so <clears throat> T is equal to zero if the firm's reported outcomes, is the firm's reported outcomes in the absence of eight, and T equal to one is the firm's actual outcomes. 
Labor Aid Capital L, Cost Aid Capital C, Fiscal Aid Capital F, and then the coefficients beta zeros will measure differences in counterfactual outcomes for firms that took up particular aid packages, and the betas with the one measure the differences in observed outcomes relative to counterfactuals for a given aid package. Then we have specific, um, we have firm specific controls, X will be uh, general employment. So it's survey measures, it's the size of the revenue chains and the industry at the two digit NASA level. Epsilon, the error term, and I already mentioned this. So let me just repeat what I just had on the previous slide. Firms that took labor aid increased the share of furloughs by 25.6 percentage point. The reduction in layoff from taking labor aid is minus six percentage point. The cost aid, smaller margin we had here, and there was also a reduction in, um, in layoff. Fiscal aid, we didn't see much. And then column three and four. So these were the um, columns three and four I had here. We take all firms in order to look at what does selection actually, the implication of, um, of selection. So what we do here is that we take all firms, we run a standard cross-sectional um, regression. And, um, and here we, uh, in that way we can, so what we do is then we can compare um, this equation, the results from this equation to the results from the free US equation in order to look into, is it really just only um, selection which implies that we get, get the results that we get. And what we can see is that this is, doesn't look like it's, uh, it's the case. So let me just conclude. So the crisis was hard hitting for nearly 7% of firms, the medium firm experiencing a decline of 20% of revenue and over one four more firm reported revenue declines relative to firms in 2016. We saw that firms experiencing decline in revenues were the primary takers of government aid. And as I said, as a stock contracts to, for example, the US, Firms that took up aid report furloughing more and laying off fewer workers than they would have done absent government aid. And the, the relationship varies with the kind of aid that firms took up. And what we can estimate is that it actually saved 81,000 jobs that, um, that the, the, the government aid pro, uh, programs by, um, by um, by giving the firms the possibility of, um, of, of using this uh, aid to furlough workers instead of, um, of laying them off. And um, so we, we estimate that by comparing how many workers they would have laid up with, off without the government aid to how many they actually plan to lay off now. Yes. Thank you, Bitte, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, uh, so I open the floor to uh, uh, for questions. I have uh, Astrid Kunze at NHH uh, asking a question here, a uh, clarifying question. Uh, does uh, furlough uh, include unpaid and paid leave? Yeah, so um, furloughs in general, just that just um, the definition is that you sent home workers and you don't really fire them, but you just sent them home. But what usually it's not something we have done in Denmark before. So my guess is that every all the workers which were sent home, they probably were sent home with the money which they could get from the government. And that implied that if the firm had uh, to lock down the business, then they would get, they would still get all the money up to a max of, uh, they, would, they would get the salary they usually get, and then they would get um, a compensation for the government, which would be 100% if it was a strict lockdown, and it would be 75% of the salary they would get from the government, the firm would get from the government, if it was not a strict lockdown, but up to a max of 30%. Uh, thank you. Then I have uh, a couple of questions uh, on uh, the chat and the Q&A. Uh, and then after those two questions, Michelle have a question as well. First, uh, Espen Moon uh, 
asks uh, for the workers, how big is the difference between being furloughed and being laid off? In terms of, in terms of money or, or what are you? Uh, um, <laughs> I guess uh, he hasn't been explicit on that, so you can... Uh... <laughs> I guess he means income. <laughs> so if you're, I guess it's, it's, the, it's the compensation rate, it's, I guess. Yeah. What is the compensation rate for the two? Okay, so I so okay, so are you thinking about for the from the workers' point of view? So how much money they get, or what are you thinking about? So because there is an issue here actually that a lot of firms they actually have, or a lot of workers they have a contract, so that uh, it's not that they are laid off and then they don't receive any money. So a lot of workers that will have a contract, so they get payment at least for uh, one month, perhaps three months, perhaps five months. So it might be the case for a lot of firms, it was a much better deal to furlough to workers and then to fire them, right? Because if they fired them, they would have to pay them a salary for up to perhaps three or five months. Whereas if the furlough to workers, then they would receive the 75% of the previous salaries or the salary they actually receive and, uh, and then they only had to pay them 25%. So uh, it is, if that is what you're asking about, that is it, it true, it might be a very nice deal for the, for the firm. So I give an uh, open the microphone to Espen if he has a following up uh, comment or... Yes, of course, I think, yes, uh, thank you. This is very interesting. So, uh, and that is an important issue, I think. So how, how big is the, really the difference uh, from the social point of view and for the workers? <clears throat> but in, if you are laid off, like in Norway, you are laid off, that means that you're getting, you're getting a support from the government that is lower than your salary, but still it's substantial. Okay, okay. And then you have, yeah. and then you have the sort of, the, and then you are expected to go, yeah. Your, yeah. Okay. The priority to get the job back, but still, at the same time, it will also imply that uh, the workers will, to a lesser extent, will be reallocated on firms. So you yeah. can think that it may sort of also sort of stop the reallocation process. Right. So I think that, but but here the point is that it's different from other crises, right? Because in other crises, you actually usually will think that this relocation is quite permanent. Here, you kind of expect the virus is going to be short lived. And as I said, what you can see already, the numbers here, it's going super well in terms of there are a lot of new job openings. So it doesn't look like uh, that it's, uh, it's something which is going to, it, it looks like it's possible to get out of this crisis relatively fast. And therefore, I think for a lot of firms, it did make sense that they actually kept the firm, they kept the workers. It is much less money if you are, if you are fired, uh, after a while at least, because then if you uh, after you don't get any more money from the from the firm, then you get uh, there's a max on how much money you can get uh, if you are on unemployment insurance. And on top of that, it's only 80 percent of uh, all, all employees in Denmark, which are paying into a voluntary unemployment insurance fund. If you're not doing that, then you get social assistance and you only get social assistance if you don't live together with someone who um, who has a salary, if you do that, then you get nothing. Or if you own a house or a flat, you, doesn't, you don't get anything either. Uh, for example, if I got uh, fired, I would get less than 50% of my salary. So it's a very large reduction in money for, from, the, from the workers' point of view. It's true, you can never be sure that it's not in some cases better, that you relocate workers instead of keeping them and then, um, kind of preventing some natural relocation of, of workers there's always this possibility but as I said I believe that if it's if um, if it looks like at the moment that it actually is is uh, you, you tend to be getting out of the crisis then it for me it, it seems that it did make sense that you fed out these workers instead of firing them so I, I see that we are uh, running a bit short of time. So, but uh, but I think uh, Michelle has a question first, and we're happy to hang on here for a few more minutes uh, afterwards to take a couple of more questions. But uh, first, uh, Michelle, please. 
Yeah, so I had one empirical question and then something related to what Aspen was asking. So in the empirical question, I was surprised to see that the ed your education sector, you saw a large decrease in revenue expectations. So in the light of what we talked about, you know, in the context of my talk, I would have expected, you know, government spend more money in, you know, education and, and to keep all these schools and so forth running. So I was surprised to see this huge decline in revenue expectation. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. And then secondly, um, preserving jobs. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of my, my point or my question was going to be related to what you just said. I think it's really not clear to me how long, you know, this crisis will last and what's the required restructuring or the implications for restructuring. My expectation is even in a year from now, people will go less to restaurants than now or theaters, you know, indoor events, I think will be quite careful for, for quite a while. So this, you know, idea of preserving jobs, which we're also doing in Germany a lot right now, I, it makes sense if you really think this is very temporary and then we go back to where we were before. It's not clear to me, you know, airline companies, tourism, all these things, I think we will see some restructuring and then maybe some turnover could be better. I, I mean, I don't know. I'm just wondering uh, what your thoughts on that are. And I think there is a big divide between the views in the US who think we need this restructuring uh, and then Europeans who are more, you know, preserving these jobs. And then let's see who does better in the long run, maybe. Okay, yeah, so the first question is actually also something I thought about this morning. I don't have any clear answer to that. There's something weird about this educational sector, I agree. Uh, to the second one, uh, it, it is actually to a lot of people were fired in the, um, um, in terms of um, a lot of the, the people in, in the industry where you, I don't think we're going to fly as, as much ever. I, I don't know, at least not for the five, first five years. So in SAS, which is a big airplane company in Scandinavia, they fired a lot of workers. And what they're doing now is that they try to put them into some other kind of jobs where they where they need it. So that's a huge program in terms of doing something about that. I'm sure you're going to see some structural changes. I uh, just, uh, in terms of, for example, um, in the airplane industry, but uh, but I'm not sure that uh, it's, it's uh, in other places, I, I don't think they're going to be as big. So for example, in terms of restaurants, it's, they're still open here. And in terms of hotels and so, it's still open. And so it's true that you can go a little bit less to restaurants because the, you have to close them at 10. So you can't have two servings in restaurants at the moment. So in, in the more fancy ones where you usually have two servings, you cannot. But in general, uh, a lot of things are still opening. And, uh, and in terms of uh, consumption and so, in general, it's actually going quite well. So, uh, so, so in that respect, I think it did make sense that you tried to keep a lot of workers instead of, uh, of, of firing them. But of course, and I actually do believe that because you did that, it was possible to have such a fast reopening. And it was also um, made it possible to uh, keep up um, the consumption in general of a lot of, of people because they actually kept the salaries so they could keep on consuming. So on top of the other kind of expensive policy you have had, this was a unique possibility to keep the consumption level up in the in the society. So I, of course, you always have some kind of reconstruction uh, after a, a crisis. I just think that this one is different, and uh, and and therefore it did make sense. So as I said, it's the first time you use these uh, furloughing eight uh, programs in Denmark. You've never done that before because you exactly thought, well, what we should do is that we should just make it, well, the natural change, which will happen during a recession. And so, but, um, but I, I think that this really proves this, that it was so fast that we tended to get out of the crisis. The unemployment rate is still, if we do look at the register number, is still only 4.3 where it was down at uh, three point, I think just before the crisis, this was 3.3 uh, 3 or 3.5. So there's been an increase and it's still, of course, we have more unemployed workers than we had before the crisis. But, um, but I, I think the type of the crisis, the type of the recession uh, is different from what it used to be. Thanks, we have a couple more questions and a lot of uh, people uh, still with us uh, in the webinar. So 
So, but uh, I want to stop the recording uh, now, uh, just uh, so that you know, that whatever is being said after this won't be uh, 